uh, United States Department of Health and Human Services. <clears throat> it's a program entitled Control of Asphalt Fume uh, During Paving. And Dr. Linda Ro Lizen Rosenstock, who has been here all day now, is the director of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, along with Mike Aka. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gergen, and members of the committee. I want you to think for a moment now about the smell of fresh asphalt pavement on a hot summer day. A smell so strong it causes you to roll up your window as you drive by a construction zone. For 400,000 American workers, this is the smell of work. Workers routinely exposed to asphalt fumes report difficulty breathing, headaches, nausea, and burning of the eyes, nose, and throat. As for more serious health effects, there is uncertainty but concern that asphalt fume exposure may cause cancer. To tackle the problem of worker exposure to asphalt, government, industry, and labor formed a unique partnership, one which developed despite the controversy about health effects. Three changes in the way we traditionally did business at NIOSH fostered the success of the asphalt project. One, we changed our zero risk policy. Two, we embraced public-private partnerships. And three, we became much more active in implementation of our own scientific findings. As to the first, in 1994, NIOSH was approached by the paving industry to help them reduce worker exposure to asphalt. Traditionally, because of the potential carcinogenicity of asphalt, this request might well have been turned down because NIOSH had a zero risk policy. In other words, if a substance potentially caused cancer, then the only acceptable exposure was no exposure. As a result, NIOSH exposure recommendations were often considered to be of little practical relevance. But at about the time of the asphalt request, we changed our policy in two ways. We announced we would recommend exposure above zero risk, and we would recommend exposure levels that could be achieved with existing or near-term technology. In essence, we turned our back on a tradition in which the perfect had become the enemy of the good. Second, during the same time period, another significant shift was taking place within NIOSH. We formed and led the first broad national network of public-private partnerships in our field. Third, NIOSH began taking a more active role in seeing our recommendations implemented. Traditionally, NIOSH describes the state of the science, makes recommendations, and passes them off to others, including OSHA, which may or may not proceed with a regulatory response, a response which is virtually always litigious, takes an average of 10 years, and costs millions of dollars. In the asphalt project, NIOSH worked with labor, industry, and other governmental agencies to move beyond our traditional role as scientific experts. We ensured that the asphalt recommendations became more than just another government document. Throughout the process, we maintained the active engagement of buy-in of all our partners. We worked one-on-one -on -one with each paver manufacturer in the design, testing, and evaluation of their controls, allowing manufacturer autonomy while maximizing exposure reduction. In just two and a half years, NIOSH and our partners achieved an unprecedented accomplishment, 100% of an industry voluntarily agreeing to implement control technology reducing worker exposure by about 80% on all highway paver manufacturers made after July 1997. And now to speak for our partners is Mike Acock, President of the National Asphalt Pavement Association. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, in my opinion, asphalt smells just great, and it's not a serious <laughs> health hazard. Um, but this is, uh, this is often the regulatory uh, stalemate between industry and government. And you add in scientific uncertainty, and it's business as usual. And that means industry and government spend many years, millions of dollars to defend their position while conditions for workers stay the same. For the asphalt project to succeed, everybody had to agree to radical change. Why not simply remove the fume from the workers' environment rather than wait and contest the science? For the asphalt road building, finding immediate solutions to major problems is a daily factor for success. This can-do attitude is a major reason why asphalt paving contractors took a proactive position in dealing with asphalt fumes rather than spending time and money in efforts that didn't lead to solutions. And it's also why the unions put themselves behind this project. We found in NIOSH a very valuable partner whose leadership, backed by talented and dedicated engineers and chemists, saw this as an opportunity to shatter the perceived limitations of government, unions, and industry working as equal partners on the same team. 
Uh, we've already had very significant impacts. Every one of the more than 900 paving machines manufactured since July of 1997 has this new technology. This project has been a win-win for all, but most especially for our employees who tell us how much the controls have improved conditions for them. Thank you, Mike. Efforts to duplicate the success of the asphalt project are underway in industries as diverse as dentistry, rock drilling, and shipbuilding. Uh, we've made workers healthier while we set aside our difference and by changing our policies, working collaboratively with our partners and actively working to see our recommendations implemented, we now have a proven innovative model for preventing occupational injury, illness, and death. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Dorn. Going to cost the industry. What's the incremental cost of adding this equipment to your sure? Uh, a paving machine would typically cost about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, the cost of the new equipment would be about two percent, of, so it'd be about five thousand dollars on the additional cost of two hundred and fifty thousand. So it was not a significant increase. And how does the change affect? Uh, liability, assuming uh, NIOSH does establish some relationship between exposure to asphalt fume and uh, cancer? I think it shows that the, uh, the industry has been very responsive. Uh, we've uh, recognized that there is a potential health hazard, and we have corrected that well ahead of the time. So I think in terms of liability, it's probably been very positive, um, but the science is very uncertain. There are a lot of confounders, and there's still a lot of scientific testing to be done. Bill Clinger, just be interested in knowing if you mentioned the fact that there might have been a rulemaking process that would have gone forward. Was there one underway at the time the, that this uh, was stalled? OSHA had recently put asphalt as a exposure on an action list, not necessarily for regulatory action, but for some form of action. So but there was this, a regulatory backdrop that. This agreement then forestalled the need for that. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Antonio? Uh, help explain to me um, how it works. The, the, the chemicals still get released to the atmosphere. so. Now, instead of the workers, it's, it's everybody. Right. Let me just explain that, because I think it's a fair question. Because what we did was clearly protective to workers, and it was environmentally neutral. In other words, the exposure was still going up. What we did was take the exposure away from the worker breathing zone, brought it up at a higher level. But although I say it's environmentally neutral, we have the opportunity, because we're now collecting it. We now, through our own scientific work, <laughs> developed the first techniques to actually measure the product that we have it in one place where we're in a position to move to the next step of actually helping to put the environmental controls in place. And in fact, two of the six manufacturers who are part of the team that signed the voluntary agreement are already starting to reduce environmental exposures through this new technology. Dr. Rosenthal, could you help me understand one thing? If, if, you want to, if you're a food manufacturer and you've got a new product you want to bring to market and you go to the FDA, they research it to find the tiniest bit of carcinogenic effect and then they forbid it to come onto the market. How, how does the government continue on with massive paving programs not knowing the answer to whether it's carcinogenic? Well, I think there are two answers to your question. One is, and I think it's fair to say, there are different levels of scientific certainty about activities and, and exposures. Had this one clearly been more carcinogenic, we would have known it. There's ambiguous data because probably if there is an increased risk, it's relatively small and epidemiologic. Uh, terms. The other thing is, as a society, we have made decisions about risk we allow for workers, which happen systematically and through the legal system and Supreme Court rulings, to be at a higher level exposure than we <clears throat> allow for those environmentally exposed, and that's just a public judgment. So if paving were to start, if, if, if people came along today and said, we'd like to start paving, the first time in history we're going to start paving the government, you have to approve it. Would you approve it? <laughs> that's the reason I'm on the research side of the fences, so I don't have to always answer those questions. Yes, I actually think that what we've, and I really want to be serious about this, while the debate goes on, our health effects document is now out for external review. It's taking us longer to get our scientific document out than was to put the fix in. We've got exposures really reduced. They're low. Workers are really better. And the one thing we all agree about is that this is highly irritating. So by getting the exposures lower, we're actually getting immediate health benefits. And actually, we are now in the process of working with the same partners, the industry, and labor to mount the first formal epidemiologic study that's going to really let us definitively answer the question that's still on the table. Right, David Osborne. Uh, there are two numbers that you've been using and are in here. One is the 80% reduction at the base of the machine. Yeah. 
and then the other is 50% reduction for the worker. Yes. And uh, I think I understand that, but I want to make sure. If you do it, you do it better than I do. It's, let me explain. The number we're certain about, the one we're measuring, this is a performance standard that says the technology at the main source of exposure must meet 80%. That's what the guidelines are about. We have very good data to show we're achieving that and often more. We have very few samples, and we have taken some that say for individual workers it may be only a 50% percent reduction, and there's a few reasons for that. Not all of the exposure at the base was getting to the worker in the first place. Some of it was being dissipated. And there's more other source of exposure besides the base. Um, but the actual worker exposure was relatively low to start, and it's now dramatic lower. And more importantly, the workers with the highest exposure, because there's variability in a road crew, some who are closer to the source have higher exposures, are